much. So, um, you know, in, in comes working with Scarlett and the Arkansas Art Council. Um, so, when you're working in branding a act and you're working with creating music, there's a lot of partners that are involved in this. So that's where a lot of the a lot of the structure of what we're going to talk about is here, and so that you don't feel like you're by yourself and you're on your own as an artist. So let's see here. After my brief introduction, we have named it "How to Sell Out Venues and Be Invited Back." Because a lot of times you can get invited to a venue. Huh? Scoot over here. Yeah. Boop. Is that better? Okay. A lot of times you can get invited to a venue. But maybe it's an ill fit, or maybe you didn't prepare yourself correctly, so you don't get invited back. Maybe you do something, um, and you don't realize that you're not supposed to do it. So we're going to go into that a little bit. So can you give me a second? So I know some people that are attending this virtually also have been in the music industry for longer than I have. We're talking about people that have been in it for three decades. Um, and some people may not have a full 20 minute set uh, yet. I mean, you guys are pretty young. But how long's your set? Three, four hours. Whatever Three, four hours? Know. Okay. So you guys are doing a lot of covers? Yeah. A lot okay. of covers and originals, yeah. Cool, cool. So everybody's at a different spot on this. So I want to start with the foundation because without a solid foundation, it's really hard to build on top of that and go further. So covers and originals, a lot of people see this as an either or thing. I actually like to do a blend of that for our own project because your covers end up being like, it's something you can fill out your set pretty quickly with. It's something that people are familiar with. But what most people don't realize is when you do covers, when you're learning it, it's almost like having a co-write with the artist that originally wrote the song and created it. There's a lot of things you can learn there. There's a lot of things you can do and you can pull into your own music. Um, with originals, of course, you have a lot of room to be creative, expressive. A lot of times that's the reason why people get into music to begin with. Will you clicky? So I like to parallel it to the restaurant industry because almost everybody I know has been in the restaurant industry that's also in the music, except for maybe these two. But uh, everybody else I know has been um, waiting tables or a cook or a hostess. Um, so when we're dealing with, and I actually I stole this picture um, from the uh, from So Restaurant. Um, I messaged the owner. I said, you know, I'd love to represent Arkansas on this. So this is one of their dishes. So if it looks beautiful, I definitely recommend going and having something from them. Um, but when you do an original, you got to do the research and development for the product because you don't already have this product. You have to write songs. You have to figure out what you're good at, where your weaknesses are. You have to find songwriting partners. You can't just say, hey guys, we're playing Freebird and everybody already knows how to play it. Let's see here. So it is insanely slow at the beginning. In fact, your first five to seven years of any startup you're probably it, like the IRS gives you five to seven years to be profitable for a reason with any business. So there's a lot of loss that happens in that time that you're investing and you're creating the brand. Um, when you're doing the covers, it's not quite that situation. And let's hear. Um, so the rest of this, it's like marketing an unfamiliar product. That's going to be the same thing as learning new stuff. Like people already know that a Rolling Stones cover band, they love the Rolling Stones but they're not gonna know that about your own project. I'm gonna have you click for a bit. And of course, everybody knows this restaurant, right? Can somebody tell me what restaurant this is from? Taco Bell. Taco Bell, yes. Um, and just like with covers, people already know they like the song. They've already tested out the recipe, they've already tested out the song, um, they know it's built correctly. And you also have, uh, but you do have a ceiling because even if you get your song placed in a film or in like an advertisement, you're still losing half of your uh, income to the songwriters because you're not the original songwriter. So you do have a ceiling there. 
Um, so when we go into, I'll be quick, when you, we go into covers versus generationals, it's an apples versus oranges thing, and we've had this, almost like this barrier for a while in Arkansas between your cover bands and your original bands, and I really think the best thing to do is have apples and oranges, but even if that's not your right fit, we can agree that the information that we're about to go into can apply to both sides of things. So. Um, let me grab my tea. So this is my addiction, by the way, is iced tea. And it's how I function. Uh, so I have tried to write my artist statement for about five years. This takes a while because musicians, we're an interesting breed of people. If I ask a musician, why do they write music? You have truly stumped them. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll is not the right answer to this question. Even if you sing it, which is what he tried to do when we first had a course. So, but, you know, fine arts has dealt with this for a long time. They, they really drill down and they go, who am I? Where is my unique perspective? Why do I bother to create art? What is my, what do I want to say to the world? And musicians, we just kind of show up with an instrument and play it. And what I found is with grants, they want this, it's called an artist statement. If you end up in an elevator with somebody and they want to know about your band and they happen to be booking for a festival, they're going to want an elevator speech. That's just a simplified version of your artist statement, a little shorter. And then your short bio is going to be the long version of this same information. Um, I will say, when you have your uh, fan information, you want a short bio, a medium bio, and a long one. If you do not have all three of these, they will take creative um, editing to what you have, and they may delete things out that you find are very important to who you are as an artist. So how you build one of these, and I've seen many different ways, but this one is the one that resonated the best with me. It's a why, a how, and a what. So what is what you create? Is it indie rock? Is it alt pop? Does it live in the space between those like we do? Um, is it blues? Um, is it classic rock? And then how? What instruments are you using? Are you using keys and guitars from the 1960s to the 1990s to harness that warm vintage sound? Are you working with antique 1920s, 1930s instrumentation? Like, what are you bringing in to show that? And I will say that everybody wants to meet the saxophone after they read our bio. Um, being able to talk about a 1922 instrument that got saved from about 50 years of being in storage tends to be a talking point. And then your why. This could have something to do with your culture, could be something to do with your background, um, could be how you speak. Um, Lizzo, her artist statement is that she, uh, or her why is that she is a one woman who believes that she is beautiful and she speaks from that positivity and beauty that anyone can find within themselves and live for. And that's where all her music comes from. So when you create this, it seems like an extra step, but it's super important because it's where you can build your whole foundation on. Will you switch one time? So I know we all want to jump right into booking our shows, right? And we have that fire within us. It's like, just, just let us near the stage. That's just what we want to do. But we need to go in and set up some things so not only we can promote ourselves, but also our partners can help promote us. Um, if you have video, if you have audio, the video, that'll help your venues be able to share your content and be able to get people to your shows. If you have audio, now you can work with your radio stations and have them playing your music to help you get that out there. Um, photos are like a must for Instagram, for social media. And of course, social media, because everybody goes to their favorite social media to look up and see what type of event there is and to check the times. You may have heard about it, you may have seen a flyer, but 
it's the day of the show. You don't know where any of that information is. Most of us go in. We don't type the band's website in. We type in on our favorite social media and we look for the event. And let's hear it. The link tree and the EPK. So link tree has been quickly rising in importance. Uh, your link tree and your EPK, for the most part, serves the same function. Uh, link tree is used by the consumer more, but I have been hearing in certain genres and, and markets like uh, in Texas that they're saying that people don't even go to your EPK anymore. They go to your link tree, and that's where they're deciding if they're going to book you. I say you need both because you don't know the person you're talking to and you want to make it an easy yes and you don't want to put them in a technology they don't understand or they don't normally use. And then the last one's the website. Websites are important. Um, they seem a little archaic, but your super fans find out everything about you from your website. And at the end of the day, you want super fans. Um, so if you set this up and you have all these elements here, and I literally have them in most important to least important. This is what helps people be able to market you and helps people be able to connect with you. So your audience. This is a hard one to swallow. Um, so you have three audiences. Your three audiences that you're going to be dealing with are the people that love your music, thriving in your music, already are showing up to your shows. This is not your drinking buddies from work. It's cool that they come out and support you. This is not your sister's family that comes out and hears you play. This is the person that you don't know any other way but from music that connected to what you are building and what you are doing. Those people are important. Don't get me wrong. Everybody needs support. The more support you have, the easier this is. But at the end of the day, that's the person you can look at and you can compare their information and you can find other people like them. And unless you can find more family members, you can't really do that with your sister's family that comes to every show. Uh, the second one is who your ideal audience is. So who do you want to find your music and who do you want that to speak to? Uh, for Lizzo, that's going to be a woman who is struggling with her identity and feeling like she's worthy. So that's her ideal person. And she can drill down and come up with an idea of what that person looks like and where they are in their life. And the third one is, who's not repulsed by you? I don't know if anybody here does event shows or gets hired or on to play a festival in which nobody knows who you are. And you're not necessarily the main draw. You just happen to be somebody that's there providing entertainment. And that's why the not repulsed by category. Trent Reznor may be the absolute amazing best industrial artist in the world. But if you put him at Electric Cowboy, things are not going to go well. Like, so understand that space in which you can entertain the people that are already there and already present um, to enjoy the other things in the atmosphere. And these three things end up being three different audiences and three different places you can pitch yourself. You feel sweet? So just a little light stalking here. Do not stalk individual people, okay? <laughs> but do start writing down um, things like this about the people that you are like these three different audiences. And this is a good little time to take a little picture of this if you would like. So things like what's your activities? If you happen to be like in a, a uh, gospel act, then you're probably not going to be booking on Sunday morning or on Wednesday evening unless you're booking, booked in a church because you're dividing your audience. Like the people that are going to want to come see you already have something that they have scheduled that day. So being mindful of their patterns and how they live their life. If the people that you are performing for, if the age demographic that you now connect with, which by the way, changes every four to five years, if they're gonna be available for happy hour, then 
how successful is that barn burner that starts at 1 a.m. going to be? So understand really who you connect with and who your audience is and who you resonate with because that sets you up for success. And different venues will work with different types of audiences. Some have multiples, but usually there's kind of a rhythm to things. So, and I know this is a lot of early stuff, but I just want to make sure everybody was on the same page on how to do this stuff. And with the venues, there's many ways to contact a venue and ask for a gig. Every venue is a little different. Also, spreadsheets are your friend. So after you contact a venue and you figure out who your contact is and how they like to be contacted and all those little side details you want, put that on a spreadsheet so that when you go back to contact them, you don't have to trust your memory from a year ago. We don't quite have the Texas Music Office here yet. Yeah, we don't have the Texas Music Office here yet, so um, we'll have to do this on our own for right now. But you can email them, um, you can contact them via by, by social media. I booked a show in Nashville at one of the premier venues just off of a Facebook Messenger conversation. Uh, so that's not dead. Some people, it, their social media is sacred and it's not for business. Other people, it's fair game. You just got to figure out who they are. Um, open mics and partnering with bands, I think, are underutilized um, options. If you can't get somebody to respond back to an email, see if they have an open mic. Because the thing is, is if you show up and you kill that open mic, you have the sound guy, you have the bartenders, you have the door people, you have the waitresses. All those people can talk about the noise that you made. And then those people can put you in contact with booking. So it's a good little side door. And the last one is partnering up with bands. Find bands that would have the same audience as you and ask them to put you on their, um, on their uh, show. Usually they have an opening spot they can slide you into. You may not pay anything or much, but you just got exposed to their fans and the venue just heard you in their establishment. Um, the most important thing, though, is to be honest. I have contacted all sorts of venues, and you get that question. Uh, who here has heard the words, how many people can you bring? Anybody here? Yep, oh, yeah. people have heard that? Oh, yeah. OK. How honest is that? Does anybody have a crystal ball? Can anybody tell how cold it's going to be that day? How rainy it's going to be? If the Razorbacks are going to lose the night before and everybody's going to have a hang. Well, most of us know the answer to that one. Um, depending on the year, it's either all wins or all losses. Um, but there's so many factors that affect that. It's really hard to be honest and give them an answer that will make them happy. So what I like to do is I like to be ridiculously honest. We have people sign up and give us what region they want to know about when we're performing. And I separate those out by region. So when we're booking in Nashville, Tennessee, I can say, I have 62 people on my text out that want us to play in Nashville and want to come to a show. Now, I don't know if the day works out, but I have that. The other thing is, is I like to tell them that I want to build a relationship with their venue. I understand that the first time I come in, up in Norfolk Brewing, we had six people. We killed it. We made connections with those six people. We got their texts and their emails. And then the next time we came back, we played for 30 people. And then the next time we played out, they played there, we were almost sold out. And now, to this date, anytime we play there, if you're not an hour early for a performance, you are sitting outside and they are opening up the garage doors so you can hear us. Um, so, and that's what you can build if you kill it and you build those relationships with those people that show up for that show. Um, but just finding venues that understand that and want to invest in you as you're investing in building a crowd there. Um, sometimes those are rare and sometimes you just find them the first time. So, okay, next slide. Okay. So I know I have talked at you for a while and you have had slides for a while. And I want to take about 10 minutes if people need bathroom breaks, if you need to get a drink from the bar, 
Um, but I would like you to kind of think about what your biggest hurdle is as far as getting people to shows and getting the word out there about what you do. Does that sound good? good. And you can write that down on a little sheet of paper and we'll come back and we'll tackle this next piece. Thank you guys. Music. And then we're going to selfish, selfishly self-promote by playing some music of our own.
So your first partner is going to be your venues, which we just talked about. It's how the venues are, like, you've figured out that this is a good venue to play at. They're a good fit for you. They're a good event. They're going to be your first partner. Um, and I'll go into what those partnerships mean. But also, your fellow bands, the media, and your local businesses make great partners. And really being a good partner to the people you're working with means a lot more than just being a person that shows up and takes. 
So with the venue, a bad partner would book a show, not post anything on social media about it. The band members wouldn't put up any flyers. They wouldn't tell anybody when they're out at a bar that they have a show going on. Um, they would just pretend like they don't know anything about it and then show up and play the show. And the venue is going to see that as a bad partner. They're not going to they're not going to want to rebook that band. If they're seeing stuff on social media being posted, um, one good way to do it is to find out what the venue is known for. Are they known for their calzones? Are they known for their chicken salads? Are they a brewery? Do they do their own beers? And highlight that instead of just constantly being like, hey, we have a show on this day. Hey, come to our show on this day. Like how many times do you see that from a band? And every time you see something from them, they're like, come to our show on this day. Yeah. Instead of, hey, on Thursday, I'm really looking forward to grabbing a calzone while we're playing our show at such and such venue. Like that engages people a little deeper and also it highlights the venue and tags the venue in that. So now they have that content that you've been posting things from them. Um, as far as your, as your, your fellow bands, I'm going to say this in the most loving way possible. If you don't like the bands you're playing with enough to share their music, then you need to be more selective in the bands you're playing with. You need to be proud of the show that you have and that you are holding with these other people. You need to lift them up. A lot of local bands got a good 20, maybe 45 minutes of material. And a lot of times you're performing it in the same order. After about your fifth time of dragging out everybody you know, you start to notice your numbers go down a little bit. And that's because how many times do you want your drinking buddies to hear the same set exactly as it is? But if there's these other acts that you're highlighting, that you're, you're selling more of a, hey, come out and hear a really great night of music where I'm performing with these other two bands, check out their songs, check out this song, check out this other song specifically. You can even do a little sizzle reel and put that on social media so they don't even have to click on multiple things. They can hear all three bands from that sizzle reel. All of a sudden you're selling an event. You're selling a once in a, a, once in a lifetime moment in which these people are gonna be performing together. They're gonna get to hang out with you. You're gonna play your 20, 30 minute set and then they're gonna hear these other two acts. This is how you beat Netflix. Because Netflix, they've already paid. They've already paid for that experience and you have to get them away from something that they've already spent money on. And how you do that is you sell an experience. And it can't be the same set that you played the last four times for them. So instead, be a good partner to your other bands. Encourage them to share that information as well. Make it a group project. Um, okay, and then let's hear the media. I love me some media. These are your DJs at your radio stations, from KABF to NPR to going all the way up to Clear Channel with the 100.3 The X. Oh, it's iHeartMedia. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> old. I also found myself calling Simmons Arena Verizon the other day, and I really felt my age because I corrected myself, I think, three times until I got to the right name. Um, so when you're partnering with media, they have a certain rhythm. They're going to know, like, I think TV usually books about two weeks out, um, where radio, you can message them three, four days before, and they can usually get you on air. Um, then you go to print, and you have, like, monthly publications. You need to send that out to them about a month and a half before your show so that they can slide it into their, their printing. Um, learn who the people are. Say thank you. Share the article. I know this sounds really silly, but share the article they wrote about you. That, you know, and tag them because that draws attention not only to the people that follow you to read your stuff, but it also draws attention to what their publication does. And it brings more eyes to what they do. So when you put these things together, you start having many hands, and it's a lot easier to lift the ship, and it's a lot easier for more people to find out about you and what you do. 
The last one is the one I don't think most people realize. It's local businesses. So when you go in and you put a flyer up in a, at like your pharmacy, or you put a flyer up at like a, um, like a bodega or a head shop, they can say no to you. They can very easily say no to you. They have to eventually take that flyer down. So you're pro providing more work for them. They're doing something really great for you by putting that flyer up. So when you, when you put up a flyer at a Mexican restaurant, that, that place needs to go on a list. First of all, it's easier to remember where all you need a flyer when you have a list. But second of all, when you're going to these places, and you're spending money with them, you are now a partner. You're not taking from them. They are letting you post up flyers and you're going in there and you're bringing your friends and you're having some Mexican food to eat. All of a sudden, they know you. They'll start talking to their, the, like if somebody asks about the flyer, they're not just like, oh yeah, some, some guy comes and puts those up like once a month. Instead, their response is, oh yeah, 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 like, I wait on them like once a week. They're awesome. They're hilarious. I've been to two of their shows. Like they'll come to your show because they know you. They're developing that relationship with you. This, being a good partner to local businesses, we have had our shows sponsored. We have had them put flyers in for a show into every single bag that left Guitar Center because, because of the relationship I built with them over like five years. This is not something you can ask of them. This is something they volunteer to you because you have grown together. Um, they can invest more in you. They can hire you for private events and private parties. But your first step is, is that you go in there and you think of them when you go spend money. So, let's see here. Our next one, online marketing. Who here feels like this? when they, they set up their Facebook ads and they're just hoping, hoping, hoping it works. So online ads used to work really good and then everybody started doing them. And then we've gotten to the point when you're like doom scrolling, because that's what it is and you're just bored and you're not really all there and you're just scrolling through. When you see an advertisement, you go right over it. And that's unfortunate because somebody is spending money for that ad and that someone sometimes is me. So the problem is, is it's expected. If you don't spend the time creating some online content for people to find, if they hear that you have a show and then they go to your Instagram and they don't see something about that show, they think it's been canceled, they think it's been pulled down, they don't think you have a show. So it is expected now. Um, and it has low results, but it also has low maintenance. You can set it and forget it. You can go into the Facebook business manager. You don't have to pay a subscription and you can schedule the time. They'll even tell you what time the people that subscribe to that page are active the most. You can schedule for those specific times. You can set it up for spe specific days. I like to do right when the show's announced about a month out if those are different dates, two weeks out, and then two days out. Those are my must-haves for my postings. And usually one will be more focused on us, one will be focused on something about the area we'll be performing in, if we're playing in Magnolia or something like that, and then the other one will be focused on something special about the venue. If I have time, I'll do more. But if you're playing two, three shows a week, Sometimes that can be a bit overwhelming and it can be a lot of content going up. Um, so they do have flexible budgets and you can even do the free version if you're really good at designing something that's gonna catch people. And let's see if I missed anything. No, it looks like I've covered most of that. So, all right, next slide. So print media. This is another way of marketing. And there are many different styles of print media. Let's see here. I really should have put a little line here between 11 by 17 and standard page because I, I treat the top two completely different than I treat the bottom two. 
So 11 by 17 and your regular standard page flyer. So I designed these on Canva. They is, there is a paid option, which I have, but you should be able to accomplish a lot with the unpaid version. And these belong in two different places. So these cost twice as much as these do, because that's how printing works. And you can kind of see why it costs twice as much. It's twice the paper, twice the ink. So, you know, people that do printing, they kind of figured that out. So what we've done to save cost is we've created a blank spot here. And uh, this blank spot was not this color, but I got a tip from a graphic designer and he said to go in with a handwritten uh, font and start typing in information in like just regular black because that's usually what you're gonna use like a Sharpie. And he said, now look and see if the flyer makes sense. And with this being white, you looked right at this band and you didn't look at us. But by changing that into making it more of a taupe color, everything worked and your eyes went to us and then you eventually made it down to this band. So I know that's a little side note, but it was super helpful when she told me about that. So let's talk about where these belong. This is, um, a lot of times I call these venue flyers because they're about the size of the flyers that you'll see on the walls. And, um, they're really good also in storefront windows if they have the space for them. It seems to be a bigger event. It seems to be a little bit more serious. Generally, when people look at them, they go, oh, hey, that's probably music. This one here is really good for small businesses. If there's a countertop, um, if there's like a little sales desk, the venue may want to help you out, but they don't have room for this. This is taking up a lot of real estate in their, in their uh, storefront. But this can fit in most places. Um, another great place for this is bulletin boards. Because if this is hanging on a bulletin board, it's huge, it's cumbersome, it's usually flopping around because this was like one pen. And this makes more sense on uh, bulletin boards. And um, another thing about these, is they will work the amount of time you have them up. So if you go out a week before the show and you put these up, you're only gonna have a week of exposure. If you put them up six weeks before your show, you have gotten six times the exposure. Same money, same gas, same amount of time you're investing, you just planned ahead and made room to allow this to do the job it can do. Also, when you go to a um, when you go to an area, you want to park your car. You want to go down one side, back up the other. If they have flyers in their windows, they will generally let you put flyers up in their window. It's a really easy cheat. And you want to put them in several places on one side of the street, and several places on the other side of the street because a lot of times areas where there's a lot of stores, there's a lot of walking traffic. So I know this sounds weird, but who has found themselves staring at a flyer for the circus? It's been 10 years since you've gone to the circus. But for some reason, you are studiously reading everything on this flyer about the circus, and you don't know why. What has happened is a phenomenon where you have seen that flyer about six or seven other times in your peripheral vision and you haven't paid attention to it. It's just been something that your, your eyes have like slid past, your brain registered it, but you didn't register that it existed. When you get to the seventh time you have seen the same like design, your mind your, will make you stop and read it and figure out what it is and if it's important to you. So the next time you find yourself reading a flyer, and as you're reading it, you're like, why, why am I even looking at this? Like, I, I, it's been forever since I've been to the circus. You'll remember that the reason why you're looking at it is because you've seen it repetitively. And then as you're walking around, kind of pay attention and see if you don't see that three times on the way to the thing you were walking to. If you put it up six weeks ahead of time, they only have to visit the same place three times, walk by it, three different flyers, and all of a sudden we're at seven. 
So that's how these work, and that's what makes them super important. Um, another thing is, is there is a certain level of, shall we say laziness amongst people? And if these are in the window, it can be after your show, and maybe they haven't taken it down yet. I know that's not gonna get them to the show, but that's more people seeing your logo, more people seeing your image, and that is closer to you getting that person to your show later on. So last part about these is take push pins, staples, and tape when you go to places and ask to put this stuff up. You wanna be an easy yes. You don't wanna be the person that made them go get the thing. So that is absolutely huge. Yeah. And um, the next two things you'll actually see on your table. So these are quarter page handbills. And I'll tell you the mistake that people make that are promoting their shows. They'll go in and the person will be like, oh, I, I don't know if you can put something up in our windows or not. But And the really nice hostess or part-time employee or even owner will see these handbills and they'll go, oh, but we could put a stack of those on the counter. Let me explain to you why this is the worst idea known to man. Because you put, first of all, these are not cheap. They're heavy cardstock. They're, uh, when you're doing printing, they, they end up taking a lot to have shipped to you. And if you set those on a counter, what happens is, is a customer knocks them over. Or somebody's cleaning the, the, uh, the counter and they knock them over. And you can have somebody that's like, they end up being displayed like that, but generally what you end up with is a person that's a neat freak and they go through and they are, they're turning them around and they're making them all facing the same direction. And there's only so many times that happens until they just pick up the stack and they throw them in the trash. The reason why is they're not mandatory to be there. They're clutter and they keep being a problem. And the next time you walk in the door and you're like, hey, can I say something? Nope, nope, because their manager got mad or that was just a constant frustration. So how do we use this? How do we have this? We use this when we have personal contact with a person. And the best way to do it is to make them ask for it. Talk to them about your music. Talk to them about what you do, what makes that artist statement, that elevator pitch. Come forward with that. Talk about the weird instrument that you have that you work with. Talk about the show you have coming up. And then have them go, is there something I can take with me? Now you have the card. And now it has value. Now it's not as bad as setting them up on the counter, but the other mistake people make is they'll go to a festival. And they'll take a stack of cards. And they just shove them in people's hands. Or how about you walk out to your car and there's a stack of flyers sitting under your windshield wiper. Who here throws away that stack of papers? Yeah, everybody. Who here has discovered their favorite band from that stack of flyers? Okay, so one person has found an amazing act. You're a DJ, you don't count. Uh, no. <laughs> I just had to say that once. Because, you know, the whole divide between instruments and, and electronica. We're half electronica, though. So um, so that just gives you a couple of things to consider and think about your highest and best use of that sheet of paper. Because at the end of the day, we're all spending money. We're all investing into this. And if you go around and you take 500 of these and you just shove them in people's hands and then you look around behind you and it's a trail of bread crumbs behind you, what good has that done you? So um, the second thing is these business cards. And these business cards, I almost exclusively use at conferences now. And there's two versions on your table. The first one's this black one. It was our first version. And it's super important to constantly update what you do because it just has some social media links that you have to look up, a website. But the second one, is vertical and it has QR codes on the back. 
Some have two, some have one. The ones that have one went to a different event than the ones that have two. And what we'll do is we'll put the exact page we want people to go to on, that, on the back of that card. So when we meet people, they, have, they only have one direction, which is to go directly to that. It's small, so you're not carrying this bulk around the conference. Because maybe you have a bag, but maybe they don't. So now if they're interested in seeing you, they have to carry this around the entire conference. Versus this that fits in absolutely any pocket. Now I will tell you not to do just these for marketing because this is easy to find after you've had a, a night of drinking and blurred remembering of what you were doing. So let's see here, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is my absolute favorite thing in the world. I don't know if anybody here knows who Tony Clifton is or Andy Kaufman. Andy is one of my absolute favorite entertainers in the world, and I, I absolutely love, love what Jim Carrey did with his character. Let's set these down. So we discovered something that Andy Kaufman really pioneered this concept of a happening, this concept of something that takes you outside of your box, the thing that is not like not your everyday life. Like if, if we can have a moment where we truly connect with somebody and they, they're completely in that moment, they're not worried about their bills, they're not worried about their, how their kid's doing in school. They're not worried about their mother-in-law or their job. They're literally completely focused on what's going on at that moment. You, you have gotten somebody's attention, and most of the time they will remember that for the rest of their life. A click is cheap. An experience is priceless. So we started doing these things with the fairies. Uh, Fleming Death Fairies, for those that remember that those days, um, where we would create these experiences for artists mem or for audience members, these these happenings. And I'll give you a couple of or an example with the fairies, and then I'll give you an example of what we do with Monster Boy Live, because they don't apply to both. You have to look at the genre you're in and what makes sense to your people. So with the fairies, we had a show that was going to be sold out. I was at the old Juanitas, and there was, wow, I'm dating myself. <laughs> and there was this line that went around the venue and around the back of people waiting to get in. And that's so that they could get as close to the stage as possible. And we looked at that and we're like, probably about a quarter of those people know who we are. Let's make sure the rest of them know who we are. So we dressed him up, and he had his hair slicked back, and he had this microphone. And it had this um, foam cover because we were nice. And um, he walked up to people to interview them and talk to them about the show as like a, like a very amateurish blogger, like YouTube personality interviewing people. And I don't like these nerdy glasses that had the little white band there and, he, and tape in the middle. And he'd ask a question. And then he would hit them in the face with a microphone as he was asking the question. And then they would respond, and they'd come back, and he'd ask another question, and back again. And it kind of went back and forth. Sometimes he'd have the microphone, and he'd just kind of like drift it away, and they'd kind of move to like still line up with the microphone. And by the end of it, he was trying to buy people's tickets for like a third of what they paid for him and telling them that he was saving them from the, the, the horrible experience that this show was going to be. And we did let security in on it. And somebody went and got security and had them drag him away. And that was a real moment. Somebody from the audience had him drug away. Mm -hmm. And the moment he got up on stage, and the people that had no idea who he was realized they had met the lead singer from the band from that moment. Those people became diehard fans because they had that experience. They had that meeting. They had something that was tangible that they could tell people about. Um, so on the flip side of that, 
is we are no longer punk rock kids, and, and that behavior is not necessarily permissible um, with the audiences we have now. Um, we decided that Beck was the right audience, like he had the same audience that we wanted. And he was playing about a month ahead of when we had a show in Nashville. So we drove to Nashville, and we had on a sheet of paper, we had a QR code, the name of our band, and, um, well, a picture of us, QR code, name of our band. And walked, like, we set things up with a venue, always ask permission on this stuff, it's always good to have everybody on the same page. But we set things up with a venue where they were okay with it, and we went and we just said, hey, here's our elevator pitch. I'm like, first of all, can, since you're here and you're bored and you're waiting in line, can I be delightfully pushy? And people would look at the flyer and go, oh, it's music, I'm here for music, yeah, sure. Like 95% of the people were like, yeah, sure, let's do this. We talked about what we did and why we thought this was the right place for us to be. We did, we talked to between two and eight people at a time, probably covered 300 of the 400 people that were at the sold out event. A year, or no, a month later, when we went and played at the sister venue, 100 people showed up for our first show in Nashville. If you have the right market, if you approach them the correct way, you can connect with them and you can get them to take your information with them and show up at your next show. Um, so let's see what I haven't covered here. It is a vulnerable space. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So it's a vulnerable space. You're going to hear no. You're going to hear people say that they don't want to talk to you. This is when it's really important to be nice. And it's hard to sometimes, because sometimes they're not nice in how they tell you no. And you go, hey, I get it, I understand. Hope you enjoy the show, have a wonderful day. And just pivot to the next person. I have had that next person be a booking agent and got my information to book me because of how I treated somebody that didn't want to talk to me. So on the flip side, it is a vulnerable space. Somebody can tell you they hate your music after they listen to it. Like, we've carried headphones before and had people listen to it. But you get more yeses than you get noes. And it's important to remember that. Um, also, you gotta be in the right space. Like, you need to be self-aware enough to know what you're between and then pick yourself that direction. Um, highest investment on time. There is planning, there is sometimes costuming. Um, there is a huge chunk of time in which you are just peddling yourself one person at a time. Um, and I think most of it's pretty covered in what I said before, but it's the best when it's combined with other things. You can video creating a happening. Now you have material for social media. You can take your paper handouts and you can hand that out when people ask you for something to take with them. Uh, we also do a second version, which is on our phones with a QR code reader, just for the people that don't want to take paper because they're being ecologically conscious or they just don't have the extra hands. I still prefer the paper because you're literally one browser close away from like them losing your link. But uh, so I try to encourage people to take a photo of the flyer or the QR code so that they have it if they want it. All right, next slide. So, okay. So let's say you have the, the show, you've promoted, you've done all the things that you need to do. Let's talk about some load in tips. So this is one where I am going to kind of be reading off the thing. I try not to do it, but I think it's really important for this. I did write them all down so people can take a picture with their phone. Um, so yeah, be nice to the staff. Usually the sound guy is drinking buddies with the owner and the bartender is drinking buddies with the owner and the hostess is drinking buddies with the owner. And there's a pattern here, which is generally the owner likes to drink. And this, <laughs> the second part of this pattern is that everybody that works at that venue either talks to the owner or they talk to the booking agent. And that's the person that has control over if you get in there again. If you're rude to somebody because you think they're below you, you're not gonna get rebooked. They ask the people that they work with every day how things went, especially if they're not there that day. Um, so showing up early. I was early-ish. 
<laughs> I always tell people to try to show up early enough to change your flat tire and still get there on time. Um, things happen that set you back on time. If you can leave early enough to get there and to be waiting for things to take off, I've shown up before and our load in time was 30 minutes after when we showed up. We find out the headlining van is gonna show up about 30 minutes before the, the doors open. So they have us load in instead of us setting up last, they have us set up and push forward so the opening band has time to slide in. So they basically completely flip the order on sound check. So we hop up there, we set up, we sound check, we push our stuff forward, and then we're all twiddling our thumbs for about an hour for the headlining band to come in, slide their stuff in, sound check, and then us be able to move our stuff back into the space in front of them. Um, so hierarchy, hey guys, if you're the opening band and there's like a cooler with Gatorade and like Rockstar energy drinks and like free beer and stuff, don't raid that. That's probably on the rider for the headlining band. The venue may have gone out and had to get certain types of Gatorade for Mr. Lead Singer and now your drummer is down all of them because that happens to be his favorite one. So ask the venue, ask if, yeah, hey, can we have some of these? Are these just set up for the headlining band? You know, don't go in and eat their tacos. If they didn't tell you there's free tacos and you show up and there's free tacos in the green room, that's probably headlining band. That's probably the people coming in on the tour and you can really kind of set a bad example or a bad um, or a, have a bad re a reputation from doing that. I was wondering why I was going to get tongue tied. Um, okay, so the next two are some things that people don't know about: um, fix it bag and um, hero bag. So, who has been to a venue and like your pedal fell apart? right <laughs> very recently or let's say the jack and your amp just like pushed in and you're standing there and you're like all i need is some needle nose pliers all i need is a screwdriver this wouldn't be a problem at my house so what you need is you need to build a little kit that has all the things that you can use to fix your equipment so you can still have a good show I'm not talking about bringing another saxophone along with you. I'm not talking about catastrophic. You gotta have a backup amp or something like that. I'm just talking about if one of these little screws falls off of this instrument, do I have the thing that I can just pop it right back in? Because that keeps you from having just a disaster. Another thing that's really helpful is having one of those universal power supplies because it has all the little different heads on it, and it's got the little dial so you can select different volts. If you have one of those, like if your pedal cord gets crimped or your keyboard cord gets crimped or pretty much anything that, need, that uses that little adapter gets damaged, you can now pull that out and you can like still have your full show and your full experience. And then that way you don't have to have multiples of those. That fixes everything. Um, hero back. We don't have a drummer. We haven't had a drummer for years. In my hero bag is a drum tool, is a drum key, because that's what drummers always need. Have a couple of items in there that you know musicians always forget. You know, have a couple of nine volts in there if you need it for your guitar or not. Have an extra set of strings in there just in case. You'd be amazed a, a string winder, even if you don't have even if you don't use one. All these little things allows you to save the day for another artist. The, that gets around, and the venue remembers that you're a problem solver. But also, the, the band remembers you. Um, okay, so the next time I make easy, um, I did say be nice to people. I don't care who started it. Be nice to the sound guy. Sometimes people are cranky. Sometimes people have had a bad week. But the sound guy can absolutely ruin you. They can ruin how you sound, the audience. 
they can cut off your microphone because you kicked them out of the band a couple of years before. That may have happened once. Um, they, they can do all sorts of things. So try to have a good relationship with the sound guy. Um, if you need an adjustment, it's a really simple request. You know, it's like, oh, you know, I like what you're doing here. It's, a, it's an interesting take, but can we just like get up a little bit of the bass out of the guitar so it's closer to like what they're used to hearing on the recordings? You didn't insult how he was mixing, but you gave a suggestion. It's a lot easier to be like, oh God, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with your ears, man. It's like, well, chances are he's been a drummer for 10 years and some frequencies aren't there anymore. So just be polite about it. And then monitor your stage time. That's huge. Like, don't go 45 minutes over your set list. Don't even go 10 minutes over your set list. Understand how long you have and um, have somebody off stage that is watching it. And when you get around the three or five minute mark, whatever, whatever length your songs are, have them do this. You know you have one song left and you can wrap that up. All right, my next page. So this is all about being easy yeses and not making just these horrible decisions that just wreck you. So after your set, I'll just let you guys drink that in. <laughs> we have all met this band member. We have, some of us have had this band member. Some of us have had this band member escorted out of the venue before my band took the stage. Um, no, that, <laughs> but the thing is, is it's important to understand how to not mess things up. Um, so clearing the stage. I think we've all had that show where we're the second band or, oh God, we're the third band. And there's a band that's not used to playing and they get done with their set and they just approach the front of the stage and they just start having a conversation with somebody that just watched them on stage for the next 10, 15 minutes, or at least that's what it feels like. Their equipment's still setting up on stage. You and your band's just sitting there waiting to carry stuff up, but you can't do it until they take their stuff off. And you swear you hear them say, how's your sister doing? And the thing is, is that for every band takes 10 or 15 minutes longer to get off stage than they should, then the last band's going on like an hour later than they should. And now they're playing to the 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. crowd. And generally those people thought that they would be home in bed by now. And we've had this happen to the tune that we went on an hour later than we were supposed to and it, it just really wrecked us because we were negotiating with the venue like hey so when do you guys normally close when can you close when can you push that back to like and I haven't had that conversation when we don't even know when that band's going to get off stage so okay so stay the whole show who here has played a show and then like ev like the band that played before you leaves right after they're set and takes half the audience with them. First of all, the venue's not gonna like that. There's, that audience is supposed to stay there. They're supposed to like be drinking, ordering food. They're supposed to be there for the whole experience. And when you bail out, first of all, you're telling that audience that the only important thing for you to, to do when you're at my show is to stay for my set. All of a sudden you can't sell the other bands on your bill. Second of all, after they've heard your set, like what, five times, same exact set, they stop showing up to your show because they've already heard that. They'll come back in a year, maybe two, when you've written more material. So staying the whole show, supporting others, you know, it's a good look and it helps you a whole bunch. Um, while you're staying for the whole show, collect emails. Um, collect, uh, we actually do texts more than emails because I'm much more effective on sending texts out than I am sending emails. But whatever works for you, whatever works for your crowd, whatever they, they respond to, going out and talking to people after you've performed and just simply asking, do you want to hear about when we perform again? Most times that's an easy yes. And most times at that point, now when you play that region, you can say, oh, hey, instead of the 32 people you have, you're like, we now have 92 people that want to hear us play in Little Rock. And it makes it easier to book. 
Um, being drama free, I think that, that goes without saying. But don't get wasted. Don't do illegal things. These are two things that go hand in hand because you have to understand the audience has a different view of this show than actually the people that are at the show and are performing. So the bartender knows that you don't work here. You know you don't work there and you're not going to go behind the bar. But to the people that are attending your show, a lot of times they look at that and they see that you are part of you are part of the venue and you're representing the venue that night. And if you are sloppy, falling over drunk, if you are doing illegal drugs in the bathroom or in the parking lot, that's going to reflect negatively on the venue and definitely on your band. So, you know, having the party and stuff, that's fun. But if you become part of a part of the reason why the security has to work more, if they have to call you a cab, all of a sudden you're not an easy yes. They now know they have, they're probably going to deal with some trouble while you're in there. And then uh, no stealing. Bless Arkansas for me having to say this. <laughs> Do not steal things from the venue. Do not steal things from other bands. Just don't. I, I feel like I even need to say that national act sometimes. We had a national act that tried to steal our merch stands because they looked cool. So, you know, keep up with your stuff. Have an inventory. Make sure you pack things. Make sure you secure your things. When you're about to get off stage, tell the people, like, hey, guys, we'd love to meet each and every one of you. Give us about 10, 15 minutes to secure all our stuff, and we will be out there to visit with you. That sends them to go get drinks. That sends them to go smoke a cigarette outside because they know you're not leaving. They know you're going to be there. And also, you can secure your equipment just in case you happen to be playing with one of these, like, kleptomaniacs. Because the number of things we have lost, and, like, and, and I'm like, I'm like, I, I see it in your car. Like, give me back, you know, <laughs> give me back my power supply. Um, so, yeah, and also marking things and putting a little tape around it or a sticker around it that's a certain color. It helps you find all your stuff. But, yeah, a little checklist. And please don't steal things. They need, somebody has to replace it. All right, and our last one. Okay, so I know this has been incredibly dense material here. Um, but good shows don't happen by accident. And we really need to stop this I don't care culture that people like to show up to shows with. Because it only happens on a local market side. When you get to the arena, they have X's on that stage for a reason. That's where the spotlight hits on that specific song. There's a reason why there's a movement and a shift at that time. And it's all because it's been planned. We don't expect you to be perfect when you start off, but we expect, as audiences, we expect improvement. So time your set. I know I said it before, but time your set, practice your set, practice your talking points as you're timing your set. Usually a talking point happens in the first like minute of uh, one or two songs, usually one or two songs before the end. And then where I like to put them is either when instruments are changing over or when the tone of the music is shifting. Are you about to go into a ballad? Have you just come from high energy? You know, that whole roller coaster thing when you plan set lists so that you keep energy flowing and you don't just kind of keep it all flatlined. So when you go into a dip, sometimes it's good to have a to have a moment where you connect with people, tell them a cute little story, and then you go into playing the next part. And those are called talking points. You don't have to record, like you don't have to practice this word for word, but practice it as far as content. Say it many different ways so it comes out very fluid and very like effortlessly. And let's see your dress rehearsal and mirror work and wardrobe. I'm gonna cover this all in one. First of all, wardrobe. Show up for the job you want. When you get off stage, you want to be easily recognizable and not look like a member of the audience. You want them to be able to find you. You want them to want to take photos with you. You don't just want to look good. 
You know how you have certain outfits where you're like, this looks really good on me, but it looks horrible in photos. Uh -uh. You need to look good in photos because you want that to go to social media and you want that free advertisement there. So wardrobe and make sure that if you're standing next to your band member, y'all look like you're in the same band. You don't have to all be wearing the same outfits. People do that. But you don't have to be wearing the same thing, but you do need to look like you would be in the same band and you'd be performing the same show together. Um, mirror work is where you basically put mirrors up and you perform to the mirrors. The first thing it does is it keeps you from getting on stage and playing like this the whole time. The second thing it does is it tells you how to move. So with saxophone, Something very, very comfortable for me is swaying. It's a good way to keep the rhythm. It's a good way to keep what's going on. And like, it's super natural for me to play like this. And then I realized after watching in the mirror how it looked and looking at other saxophone players that were major components of their band, they put one foot forward and one foot back and they swayed like this. And to me, that doesn't feel much different. But this looks like I've entered the music. And this looks like I'm nervous and I'm pacing. And your eye is tracking back and forth, back and forth. And it's just, it's like, it hits the brain differently. So, and sometimes you'll see metal musicians and they will go into this stance all the time. <laughs> And I'm sure that feels cool. It feels like you're in the moment. Takes horrible photos though. So understand your body position, understand like they're playing a, a heavier sound and he doesn't have that, that power stance, that wide stance. He's, he's more narrowed his look. He's done the one foot forward and he's going forward with it instead of going down and wide with it. Cause we're from Arkansas, why is not the thing we need to emphasize? So, um, okay, so dress rehearsals. That, that's one more thing with, um, so you're where you picked out your clothes, you're having, you're doing your um, rehearsal of your set exactly how you're gonna perform it. Where are the clothes you plan on wearing on stage? Sometimes you sweat really bad and bad and like fake leather pants. You realize that you're going to get 30 minutes into your show and there's going to be a serious problem. Maybe those bell bottoms, maybe that catches on the uh, on your pedal. Maybe you're wearing a dress that has all sorts of cool embellishments and when you put a saxophone against it, it hikes up your dress because it grabs onto the fabric and yanks it up. So that's why dress rehearsal is important because you know it's like you're an athlete. You're performing in what you're going to be um, actually doing the performance in later on. And I believe this is the end of the densest part of this. So I'm going to give you guys a little break, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about grants. And grants are free money, well, somewhat free money. And um, talk to you about my experience in working with the Arkansas Arts Council and um, how I've been able to help fund what we do. Will we have Q&A then? Yeah, yeah, we'll have Q&A then too. All right, thank you guys. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes or so for restroom. Are we on time? 
consider the most important one. So I'll let people get a little settled and stuff. And we're going to talk about grants and how to get free money. So I know people like to um, think of grants as this imaginary thing that exists. It's for other people. And the truth is, is if you are creating art, then you should be getting your share of grant money, and you should be using it in the right, uh, in the right avenues. So a little one-on-one, -on -one, one, uh, one-on-one of grants is that generally grants are given to you to accomplish a task. So there's a few grants offered by the Arkansas Arts Council. And I have uh, become a huge advocate for them because of how much they've helped us. Um, and these are actually real checks and paycheck stubs from uh, things that they've helped us with. And also Ma.org because, you know, after I figure out one person has free money, I go look and see if others do. So I took this course from um, that the Arts Council brought to Little Rock called uh, Artist Inc. And they were talking about the business side of music. And like many musicians who had been in the game for about a decade, I was like, I don't need most of this. Uh, none of this applies to me. Artist statement, a CV, what is this? But what they did is on the seventh week, they had something there where you met a person that was in charge of handing out grants for the state of Arkansas. And I was like, that, that is worth my time. <laughs> so I worked the program, I did the things because I am a Capricorn and I hate being the person that did not do their work. So I'm making these documents, I'm, you know, I'm looking at this and I'm like, what is a CV? Cause like, I understand EPK, I don't understand what a CV is. So a CV is a thing that you create, a document that you continuously update, and it has every single gig you've ever played on it. Sounds fun, doesn't it? Especially since you've been playing for like 12 years and you don't have record of this. And you just kind of dig in, you start working on it, and it ends up being 10 to 25 pages long. But grants want to see this. But I found out something. You can edit this, and you can put a, put a shortened version on your EPK, and you can totally use it to market your band and show that all the things you have done. So a lot of this overlaps. But I did, I filled out all these forms, or I created all these documents for going through this process. And I thought, I will never use these. I will never see these again. I will never use them. I have no use for this. And then the pandemic happened. And I started like looking at grants because the other thing we do is we own a salon. And, that was another thing that wasn't happening. So I went from having $10,000 worth of bookings um, in the springtime to zero. And then my entire book cleared off because we weren't allowed to do hair. And I was like, what am I gonna do? Because we're not independently wealthy. Like we, we use money to go do things, right? And to live and to eat. So I started filling out these documents and I, I'd read and I'd say, artist statement. I'm like, Hey, wait, I got one of those. I'm digging through my files. And then, then I, I read a little bit more, and it's just like, okay, submit your CV. And I'm like, I have one of those, too. So I'm pulling out the CV from 2017 and updating it and sending it off. And we ended up with about $40,000 in grants that helped us during the pandemic. And that changed our whole experience that we had. So, yeah, I'll take a moment to talk about a most recent grant that we received. It's called the Sally A. Williams grant. Okay, I always forget the middle initial. And from what I understand, she was a fantastic woman, so I like to give her credit. Um, this is an education grant. And it's something I've noticed with the Arts Council is you generally don't get a grant to go, like, to record your next album. I'll be real honest. Your next album is not what is preventing you to be successful. What's preventing you from being okay. successful is being able to go and educate yourself and become better at your craft. What's preventing you from being successful is valuing yourself when you give somebody a price for them coming and having you perform. 
And the Arts Council really sets it up so you start value, valuing your art and valuing what you bring and understanding that that has value to it. Um, the latest one we got, the Sally Williams one, is about, basically it's an education grant for you to go somewhere or to attend a live stream thing. Uh, so what we've used this for in the past is we went, we did virtual South by Southwest last year, yeah. or earlier this year, my bad. Do not ask for in person. People have been on drinking sprees there and have not done the education, so that's not gonna work, but any other music conference you can probably do. Uh, we recently went, like October the 1st, we flew out to LA. Now this grant covers up to $500, but you have to match it with money out of your own pocket. Both of us qualified for it. So both of us got the grant. The Arkansas Arts Council is putting $1,000 of our bill to go to LA. We went to this thing, it's called the Guild of Music Supervisors. This, huh? Oh, the conference, yeah. Guild of Super, uh, Music Supervisors Conference. And we went to that, we got to hear from music supervisors of different genres about what they were looking for, what challenges they were having, what frustrations they were having working with artists. It's great to hear it from a horse's mouth. We got to meet people that own music libraries, people that were sync agents, people that were composers that had been writing in this field for decades. And the Arts Council paid for half of our Airbnb, half of our Ubers, half of our ticket tickets to fly out there, and then half of our tickets to attend the conference. If going and doing something costs you half the money that the sticker price is, you can do more and you can expand more. From there, we were able to develop relationships. We have placed uh, three songs with, no, four songs with APM, which is a division of Universal's um, and they did handle like Marvel movies and stuff. I'm not saying we're gonna get Marvel money, but the people selecting the music for that is gonna have to flip past our stuff to get to what they're gonna select at the minimum. Um, so you can do this sort of thing with these grants and it's smart to work on your local level first because now on your EBK, on your CB, now you have evidence that somebody trusted you with grant money and you did the thing that you said you were gonna do with that. And as you build up this list of like grants that you have received, then all of a sudden you're vetted. And when you're submitting that, you go a little higher on the list because there's a better chance that you're gonna do the thing that they hand you grant money for. It's hard to get 10, 20, 50 thousand dollars when you haven't been trusted with 500 yet. Um, so, that's my thing about grants. It's super easy to apply. They also have a program called Arts on Tour. They'll pay 40% of your booking fee to certain organizations. It's state run, like museums, schools. Um, we've done stuff for 501Cs that get counted. Um, we've done universities. That's schools. Good job, Chris. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. He's, he's working without caffeine and I'm working with caffeine, so we have a delightful experience up here. Um, but yeah, so we work with that. There's a arts and education um, program that you can become part of uh, in which they help with the funding on that. They also have working with veterans program, um, which is something they've put a lot, of, a lot of energy into trying to make more successful and more people being involved in it. Um, so you find your little niche, you find a way that you can connect with your community, you find a way to improve the community you're around, and they help you do it. Um, we're not on our own, it's not just for jazz musicians and like people playing banjos, like they will, there is room for a metal musician, there is room for a classic rock musician, there's room for, I can't remember your genre. <laughs> Classic rock. Oh, you're classic rock too. Okay, cool. I, and I already know you know that there's room there's room for DJs in there, electronic artists. Um, so let's see. I think it's time to do Q and A. So you have me. What do you want to ask?
I can let you guys think because I think Scarlett said she had a question from the peanut gallery. No? No. Oh, okay, okay, cool. So, um, what can I answer? Well, on the, on the grants, when you get the grants, are you expected to, are you have to pay that back or? No, no. Um, so with grants, um, you do have taxes you'll owe on the grants, so you have to report that income. But you can totally itemize against that and reduce that tax burden. Um, that's huge to remember to itemize against it. Um, yeah, so grants are, are basically, it's a check that you get to go do the thing. So, um, which is, like I said, we have, we have, yeah. You don't have to pay it back monetarily, but they do want to know about your experience and they will have some things that you have to submit in order to finalize the grant. Yeah, yeah. So, for example, our Sally Williams, um, we have to talk about the event that we attended. It's a little paragraph section. It's a one-page thing. And then the second little paragraph is how that helped your career and your, your artist practice. And then photos, you have to have, um, I think, three photos with you in it of you doing the thing. Um, so, and then you have to submit your budget and your receipts for the money you spent. Um, it, it's really streamlined. I think, I think I have submitted a side about, keep in mind, I've done this quite a few times, but I think the last one, I think it took me about 25 minutes for me and Chris both to apply because I'm better with words than he is. Uh, he's good with lyrics and he's got the four octave voice. That's what he's got and music in his head. Um, but I think it took me about 25 minutes or so to submit for the app, uh, for the grant and then it was less than a week later, they sent me an email and told me we had been awarded it. And then we went out and we did the thing. And when we came back, um, I'm almost done because I can be a little, I can be a little wordy with my responses. And um, I'm almost done submitting the information. And look, it's usually a week later, I get a check in the mail. And it's, it's really that quick. And the thing is, is, they're giving me they're giving me five hundred dollars a piece for this. I spent I think it's about twelve hundred additional dollars of our own money to do this. So, but I can take all of those receipts and I can use those on my taxes because I'm reporting that income that they've given me. So, and then I can write off other things against that income as well. So, you only pay taxes on your profit. Right, which isn't much yeah. when you're buying so much equipment. Yeah, but like if if I spent, if they give me $500 for this and I've spent that $500 on expenses, it pretty much washes it out. Right. Yeah. So let's see here. Any other questions? And you can ask all sorts of stuff because sometimes when you, when you ask a question, somebody else in the room has it too. Okay, so the Arkansas Arts Council is going to be your first step, which is part of the uh, Arkansas Heritage Foundation. Is that right? No foundation. Oh, no foundation. Arkansas no foundation. Heritage, yeah. um, which is a division of the state government, and the Arkansas Arts Council is under them. And Scarlett is, is my number one homie on this. I love her. Um, and the, the cool thing is, is they don't expect you to speak grant speak yet. They don't expect you to know how to do this. I have called Scarlett on something that literally needed like three words. And I'm like, what does this mean? I don't know. The words, they don't make sense. What do you want? And she's, huh? Is it not worthwhile trying to do that? Like everybody's hand has a Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
a thousand dollars um well to hope watermelon festival you only cost six hundred dollars because after they pay you that thousand dollars they're going to turn around and they're going to file i think it's two forms one before and one after a um and i've gotten this from the people that do this i haven't gotten this from like doing it myself um an invoice from the band that they get beforehand and then a cash check that they get from their bank after you deposit the money so you get your thousand dollars pretty much after you've gone through all the steps to get on arcs on tour all you have to do is tell people you're on arcs on tour send them a link to it and kind of explain it to them if they've never used it before but you become a lot less expensive for them to book yeah and you're still getting your work so if their budget is only $600, but they really want to book you, Arts on Tour allows you to take that full amount still instead of negotiate down so that they can afford you a fitting budget. And that's designed so that artists understand that, that they are valued and their work does have that. And it encourages people to book people on the roster and book people from inside the state. Um, on top of that, ma.org, don't pay if you go to another state, that goes to 50%. And if you play in a rural area, it goes to 60% that will be covered through a very similar uh, program that's partnered up to. And it's the, um, we're part of six states that's in the group. And so there's five other states that you can go to, Texas being one of them. Now it's only certain types of bookers, but um, generally the people with the money are the city and state agencies anyway, museums, stuff like that. What do, you, what do you think the most effective way is <laughs> for a band to break into another market, like a, like outside your like outside your, your area? Outside your area. Yeah. We've been lucky enough to, to to for it to be easy in one instance and difficult in another. Yeah, like yeah. We like so to go, we like to travel to different areas of the state, but getting that sometimes it's that first time in. Yeah. Thing, you know. With new so, so the question is, is what's the best way to break, because I don't know if the microphone picked that up. So the question is, is what's the best way to break into a new market? Um, and the honest truth is, is what you're experiencing is very authentic and it's very real. So it being spotty and hit or miss. Uh, what we have found that helps is there's an organization called So Far Sounds. And outside of Arkansas, I'm trying to get so far here, but outside of Arkansas, what So Far Sounds does is they will organize a secret show. They don't tell anybody the bands that are playing. These people buy tickets to go see three bands that don't even know who's playing. They, it's an acoustic show. It's, they don't even know the location. Three days before the show, they send out the location. You don't find out what bands are performing until you show up and see it on the marquee. And from there, you have a 20 minute set. They pay you a hundred bucks, maybe 150, depending on how many people are there. But what's valuable about this is that that is 40 to 200 people. If it's closer to 200 people, they'll give you 150 bucks. And they usually sell out their events. It's 40 to 200 people that are exposed to your music and now you have a connection within that market. So what we're going to be doing with that. Then that's when you can buy yeah. stuff like handbills. Yeah. So that's when you use the handbills. You go out and you talk to people. You hand them the handbill and you say, hey, we're going to be performing for you tonight. We're super excited about it. If we are like your flavor of music, please take this handbill, um, scan it, you know, follow us, how, whatever works for you. If we're not your, your flavor of music, just leave it on the table. I'll be by and pick it up and just recycle it tomorrow to the next show we have. Um, but how we're wanting to use that is going and playing like a So Far Sounds the night before and then the night after that performing at a venue. And the cool thing about that is we're not going to be taking anything from the venue by doing that because So Far is not going to advertise us. They're going to advertise the idea of the show. So nobody's going to be looking at, at our shows and going, do I go there so far or do I go to like their brewery show? They're, they're only going to see the brewery show. But the people you see us so far, you're going to be like, hey, tomorrow night we play for like three hours over at this brewery. You guys should come out. 
and then you can drag those people over. So that's the next step in how we're going to use so far. Um, outside of that, that's telling the area, like, there's a few ways. Let's say there's a lot of people on Spotify that's listening to your music, and you have, they do have a chart. You can look at Apple Music. All those tend to have something that breaks down where you have people engaged and listening. That gives you an idea of what areas to move into. Um, and you can cite those going into the venue. You can ask the venue to add you to a pl their playlist so that their, your music plays overhead in their mix that plays when people are there. Um, you can create that digital content. You can mail them flyers. Once again, that's hit or miss. I have seen venues tell me, I don't know why nobody showed up. And I, I'm seeing my flyers sitting on the manager's desk as I'm being told this. And I'm like, but well, y'all, y'all didn't do anything. Like, you know, it's like my partner did not partner. But sometimes you have to have that one show where six people show up. And then those six people talk to other people. And then the next time you have 30 and the next time you have it sold out. And the, it really works through like that. Like, I've had venues apologize. Like, we didn't realize what we booked. We are so sorry. We'll, we'll be good next time. And sometimes that's that's just that's just the way it works. So, but yeah, it's a little hit and miss. You can do a little bit of searching by seeing who's following on Facebook and targeted marketing and stuff. But you know, you're kind of throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks at that point. So yeah. What was the question you had, Scarlett? Can't govern. You're free. Oh well, yeah. Um, marketing. How did you build your connection with the? Uh, the different places that you are breaking into. Okay, yeah. Um, so how we how we built our relationships with the places that we're breaking into has kind of been. I would love to say it was well planned. Um, I had I had this idea that to really get attention being here in Arkansas, um, with us being an indie project and mostly leaning on originals and stuff that we needed to make a lot of noise in Nashville and a lot of noise in Austin. And because they were equal distance. And the more noise we could generate in those, the harder it would be to ignore us. Um, this plan has worked amazingly well. Um, and we've gotten in close with our BMI uh, representatives, which if you, you should have, be with a PRO and you should start reaching out and finding somebody that you have contact with there ask some questions, um, get, just build a relationship, just like how you build a relationship with media or anybody else. Like, hey, how do I do this? Hey, I'm releasing a cover and I'm kind of confused. Like, how do I list this? You know, and you build that relationship. And they've helped us a lot in those two avenues. Um, a lot of it's just been what fate has presented in front of us. Um, for example, we got, you know, if you get involved and you put a foot forward, sometimes the next foot forward shows itself after you've made that first step. Um, so we were part of an artist community on Facebook that led to us meeting a lady that works in music, I think uh, maybe up in Illinois or something. So she contacts us and says, hey, I'd love to give you guys your first music conference um, like showcase. Apply to this thing that I'm part of. And I fly for it, and I'm like, so where's Pennsylvania again? It's very far away, apparently. So I was like, oh, we probably won't get it. And, you know, a week later, hey, so we got you booked on this showcase, and here's your night. And I'm like, oh, great. Fantastic. So I ended up booking something in Nashville because I was headed up to Pennsylvania. And then from Nashville, from that performance, we got to meet a really high up person at BMI. And he turned around, and because we met him, we asked our L.A. guy, who is just kind of like, we met him when he first started out. We start talking to him about meeting the guy in, in Nashville and asking questions because we're working with him. And he puts us in touch with the guy in Austin. So it's one thing has led to another, has led to another, to the point that we were at, um, we were backstage at um, uh, Austin City Limits Festival meeting managers and booking agents and other artists and we were the tiniest people there like every other artist i met 
had just gotten done touring internationally or just got done with the late show and I'm like so I got like 65 followers on Spotify you know <laughs> but the thing is is they made space for us and they invited us to that and um, you know I'm sure the same thing happens with ASCAP but BMI I can speak from experience has been very good on helping us so I hope that gives a little idea on that so yeah. Anybody else? Well, it's it's five past, it's four past seven, so. Okay. Well, cool, cool. We can we can conclude this and everything. Thank you guys for showing up. Please share the information I have given you. Please, please, please share that information. If you have a question, contact me. Like everything on those little flyers comes directly to me and Chris, which means they come to me. So it'll be like Veronica, you gotta think. Um, and like yeah. share it with other people. Like he's a smart one. <laughs> and he's a talented one. Um, so yeah, um, I recommend um, something uh, that the Arkansas Arts Council is gonna be bringing to um, to Little Rock in the springtime. Um, in fact, um, uh, Felicia has actually been a, um, we met her at the Artist Inc. And so we're both fellows of that. And that introduces you to ma.org and it also helps you build out your, um, like all these documents that you'll need for bigger, uh, bigger um, grants and stuff. And it gets you speaking the language of fine art, so to speak. So thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.